think is really short and sweet. Um, my husband loved each and every one of you in his own way. Whether you could be mad at him one day and the next day you forgot why the hell you were mad at him to begin with, you know. So I'm going to read this off this card. This really meant a lot to Tony. And last year I had a really rough time with losing a lot of my family members. And when I would get down, he would read this to me. So, here we go. If I can see it with these black vocals on, okay? That's always a chore. So, this was written by the 14th Dalai Lama. It says, the true meaning of life. I know, I never stand right now. We are all visitors on this planet. We are here for 90 or 100 years at the most. During that period, we must try to do something good, something useful with our lives. If you contribute to other people's happiness, you will find the true good, the true meaning of life. Okay? And so that being said, um, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you guys can see it or not. Uh, Teddy was a big advocate for the band Pussy Riot. And he has a Pussy Riot t-shirt over there. We are going to do this as a silent auction. And all of the money will go towards a fund that I will start next month. The Tony Briggs Memorial Fund. And this fund will help teenage homeless children transition into adulthood and also help single mothers and fathers either if they can't feed their kids or pay their light bill, we're gonna do that for them, okay? So there's excited sheet, and um, I love you all for being here. I really do, and all your love and, and hugs and kisses that you've given me over the last couple of weeks. Peace out. <laughs> well, all right, thank you, Kelly. Um, and then um, someone from a Kelly from Tony's uh, family wants to say a couple uh, words. Okay, Don. Um, Don, come up. This is okay. Tony's cousin, Don. Is Don? Yeah. 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 Yeah seen me before in your entire life. I <laughs> have. <laughs> Kelly. Uh, Tony and I were 10, 10 months apart. He was born in January and I was born in October of 1956. Uh, as you, most of you know, Tony was raised by his grandmother and his grandfather. Uh, my grandmother, her name was Cordy Marie Briggs, and my middle name is Marie, after my grandmother. Uh, Tony and I went to school together from the time we were five until we were in high school. Uh, so, although you've never seen me before, he was, he was my cousin. You know him as the hard rocking punk singing, talented, crazy, weird guy. I know him as the little sweet boy who played with toy soldiers. Played army and you know Tony when uh, he was younger they called him Hitler. His nickname was Hitler. Right. Well, how he got the name Hitler, I don't know what he told y'all. Y'all know Tony told some stories. I know you know. He told some stories, but whenever Tony played games, we played games in Proud Town. We were born, raised in Proud Town. He was always the bad guy. And so when the kids were playing Army, everybody was on the Americans team or whatever, but Tony played Hitler. And so one time is all it took, and that name stuck with him. So if you ever wonder why he got that name Hitler, it's because he always, if he played, if we were playing Batman and Robin and all those guys, Tony played the Joker. <laughs> you know, because that's the way he was. I know I look kind of strange to you to say, this is Tony's cousin. And uh, by the way, that's my brother Rufus back there. Uh, you saw his sister, she was over here feeding her face. That's the name. We call her Bodie, and she got her nickname because her legs were bold. So in Brown Town, it was like everybody had nicknames. Fat Albert, um, the Fat Albert crew, but it was Hitler. 
and Bodie. Uh, I forgot, lost my train of thought. But Tony was the hard rocker. I was, the, as you can see, the Baptist church going girl. So all we did at Kelly knows was fight, 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 fight. About five minutes in a room together. It all it took was five minutes and we'd be arguing and fighting. I'm singing about Jesus and Tony's singing about, you know what, people. <laughs> But I tell you what, out of all that I sang to, I sang with a band called Ashanti. We were like this about music. All the bands I, I sang with, all the big time gospel players in Lexington that I sang with, and you all know some of them, Keith McCutcheon is one. Tony was the only person in all my life that ever gave me an opportunity to be in a record studio. And I was singing with him on the compilation album where he sang, uh, uh, I Give You a World. And I'm the other little girl singing out there with my cousin Tony, and he's showing me how to rock, and I did. I want you to know that although you see us three, we are his family, and it's a huge family. We got a lot of cousins. Tony loved you guys. You all were Tony's family. He didn't talk about us. He talked to us about y'all all the time. He loved you, and I am so grateful to this woman right here. They gave their lives to each other. She gave to Tony what the rest of his family could not. Where we let Tony down, you all picked him up. And for that, we are so eternally grateful. Thank you for loving Tony T. Thank you for I just wish he was here to hear me say something positive about him. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Bruce. Uh, Mike Frazier. Mike? Tony. Anyway, um, I don't really know uh, very many people here. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mike Frazier. My wife, Pearl, uh, is over there. And, uh, hey, hey, hey! Keep camping! Um, just to say who I am, I'm, uh, actually, I'm a math professor at the University of Tennessee. So you may wonder how I know Tony. But I think, except for his family members, I've maybe known him as long as anybody in the room because I met him when we were both about 13 years old. Must have been over 50 years ago now, 1969 or so, down at uh, Dennis's Bookstore on North Line. Remember that? Dennis's Bookstore? He was there because he liked comic books, and I was there because I like comic books. He liked uh, Marvel, I like DC. And I got to know him because he had an idea to connect all the, the people interested in comic books and sort of trade among each other and sell to each other. And I, I learned a lot from him, and I wanted to say a few words, even though I'm a teacher, about how about how much I learned from, from knowing Tony. So one thing I learned was how to wheel and deal, how to make negotiations, you know, how to make, can you hear me? Not, not really, I'm sorry, I don't know how to be more clear, but I learned how to make, <laughs> thank you. I learned how to make trades and deals and negotiate with people, I learned a lot from Tony about that. Um, we were kind of, we were kids and we didn't have any money, so we went out any way we could to try to get a little more money to buy more comic books. His buddy Gary, does anybody know Gary here? His buddy Gary had a paper route, and there would always be like a few extra papers, and so we would carry them around and sell them to people. So it looks, I was kind of like the nerdiest looking little 13 year old kid you've ever seen, and we were running around Pearl Town selling newspapers to people out on the porches. Why do you want to buy a newspaper? And I learned something from Tony. When we run out of newspapers, the extras, if we still thought we could sell some more, he taught me something. He said, you go down to one of those kiosks that has newspapers, and you have to pay for one, and then you take all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and you carry and sell those, and you make even more money. So he was kind of a hustler even back in when he was 13 or 14. Um, and we went all over town looking for comic books together, walking places. When we did anything else to do, we would like sing stuff. I remember walking down the street singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic with Tony. We didn't know too many songs that was of the same type because we had a little bit of a different background. He pointed out to me that my voice was not smooth, which everybody has uh, agreed with since then. But it, was, it must have been a spectacle. 
But there was a bookstore, uh, Bill Barton started a bookstore, and he had a back room. He let us hang out there, and we would just hang out there in the summer and on the weekends and just sort of talk and do stuff. I would ask like really stupid questions like, do black people get pimples and things like that? He <laughs> didn't think this was a very smart question. Uh, in the back room there, if nobody's watching, we'd check out the men's magazines that Bill had back in there, so we'd check out Playboy and stuff. I lost track of him, you know, after I went away to college and stuff for a long time, and then in the late 90s, um, I saw his name on eBay when I was looking for com more comic books. I'm still collecting comic books. I saw his name on eBay and they reconnected. He had his bookstore in the old bookshop, and I'd go down there and I'd see him there. In the last few years, I would just see him like once a year at Christmas. I'd bring, come up and, and bring a few comic books we trade or talk about stuff. But I learned a lot from him, and the last conversation I had was maybe five weeks ago, just between Christmas and New Year's, I saw him. We were talking about politics and something, and he said, uh, and I was complaining about certain voters, I won't really go into details about the political conversation, but he said something I think very wise. He said, they're not bad people, they're just ignorant. And I think that's an accurate observation of Tony, that he had a good understanding of people. And the thing I wanted to say is that I learned a lot from Tony, and I think because I happen to be lucky enough to meet him that early in life, I think I'm not as ignorant as I would have done otherwise. And I just want to thank Tony for that and for his influence on me. I think he influenced everybody he met. And I'm just a random example from way back in early in his life, and yet he had a lasting impact on me. And I just want to acknowledge that and thank him for that. And I want to thank Kelly for this nice occasion. I think it's very appropriate and just, just right for Tony. And I just want to um, express my appreciation to him for having known him. Thank you, Mike. You're, you're totally right. Tony had a lasting impression on us all. I mean, he changed, he turned you on to stuff that you didn't know, and um, just, it's, it's, it's crazy. But we got, we can sit up here and talk, you know, for the rest of the damn thing. But we got one more guy we want to have come up, um, Moses. And I know he knows how to talk into a microphone. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Um, once again, man, we got people from Louisville, Tennessee. Mike came up. Everyone's coming around, giving Tony the love that he deserved. And um, after this, we're gonna play some fucking punk rock music. Yes. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Moses. I first met Tony in. February of 87, when I was 19, I'm 52 now, and uh, I wanted to uh, come up with a speech, but I've been working like 12 days straight and wasn't able to write my speech, so I'm just gonna freestyle it here, but um, I mean, I didn't even really know where to begin, but Tony was uh, definitely a punk rock hero of mine. And, and when my punk rock band got going in 89, 90, Gnarly Love, Tony was one of the first older guys to take an interest in us and help us get some shows. And the first Gnarly Love show with Willie Ames on drums was opening for Vela Tears in 90 at, uh, at Linus, where we were told if anybody slam danced it, John Linus said we'd have to change the music, and I said, well, fuck off, you fat fuckers. <laughs> John Linus. But anyways, but Tony really, I mean, Tony, I, you know, I had the pleasure of spending three hours with Tony the night before he died, and we had a great conversation, and we talked about a lot of funny stuff, and I'm going to miss him so much. Just talking to Tony was an experience in itself and uh, you know I'd say you know I have three three punk rock heroes in Lexington and Tony was you know I probably knew Tony a little bit better than than a couple of my other you know older punk rock heroes but I mean I just absolutely loved and adored Tony even when he pissed me off and he just had uh, a lot of interesting things to say that could really fucking trip you out when you were talking to him. And, and that's, that's what I'm really gonna miss is just the conversations with Tony were fucking hilarious. 
And so I'm going to tell you about my first ever encounter with Tony. I used to have a long rat tail. Okay. And people, people make fun of it now that it, that it was my mullet, but so I was in the bottom line and Tony was sitting next to me and he said that. Uh, if said, hey little boy, he said, you're pretty cute with that little rat tail. He said, you ought to put that rat tail up in a mohawk and make some liberty spikes. And he said, you're a pretty little boy. I'll have to take you somewhere. Let's go somewhere. And, and, and I had seen a lot of shit by the time I was 19, you know. And so I asked my buddy Toby, I said, what's up with the wacky Rasta guy saying crazy shit to me? He said, oh, he's not a Rastafarian, man. He's like an old punk rock guy who sings in the band Veil of Tears. And I thought, oh, well, okay, you know. And so it was really like 88, 89 is when I got to know Tony. And uh, I know everybody in this room that goes way back with Tony, the stories stretch on and an exponential nature of like, it's just one from the other, you know. And, uh, so, yeah, yeah. And so I could probably, you know, lose my train of thought up here talking about Tony, but he really was, you know, you know, a hero. And I would go out to see Vail of Tears, and uh, you know, one thing is laugh about the Lexington, you know, music scene. Like you get to a point, and sometimes everyone would think each other sucks. Like, yeah, you're fucking bad. You're fucking, I'm, I'm the fucking man, you know. And then like, and, and Gerard Figs and I laughed for a million years because Tony told Gerard one time, Gerard, I'm the only rock star in this town. And, <laughs> And we fucking laughed about that forever. But uh, but I, I love Vela Tears. When I go out to see them, I thought they were totally fucking weird with the saxophone. And, you know, and just, and I like Tony's fucking weird voice. Lots of times I couldn't understand some of the stuff that Tony was singing. And, uh, but, you know, the feel of the music was there. And I had a lot of friends that weren't really died in the wool punk rock people but they would go out and see them and, and they'd get all flipped out about it because they feed off Tony's energy and uh, you know, I could probably go on and on I don't I don't know I get a little emotional up here because I, I really loved him and uh, it's been coming up on 20 years ago my wife Sheila and I took Tony up to Cincinnati to see Patti Smith play and man, I'm telling you, that was a fucking night for the ages seeing Patti Smith at Bogarts. And, uh, and Tony loved Patti Smith so much. And all night long, old school punk rock people from Dayton and, uh, and Cincinnati were coming up to him. All People were recognizing him from way back in the day. And he had like the total celebrity treatment all night long at that Patti Smith show. And uh, so... I don't know. I don't know what else to say, but uh, I, I love Tony so much, and I'm going to miss him. And uh, I can relate to Tony as far as being a misfit that has, a, you know, a, a misfit and an outcast, and and definitely, you know, and it all. I would always thank him for years. You were one of the first people to help gnarly love, and that means so much at a time. You know, we would have made our own way, but Tony helped us, and, and that that meant so much. And and I've been sneaking into listening to the Vela Tears record as much as possible lately, when and I can get a little free moment to to rock out to those songs. And uh, so, anyways, Tony, I love you. I hope you can hear me up there. Yeah. Love you so much. It's the call of the world. Good job, Moses. I love it. Um. Thank you. 
โครงการ